Christine test Christine test Christine 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 guest number 1 test 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 Supervisor, 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 testing, supervisor, testing, supervisor, testing. No, the testing. No, the testing. Non ve li so 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 testing. Remy testing. Remy testing. Let me testing. One, two. Remy, Remy testing. All right, thank you. Patricia testing. Got like a testing? Got like a testing? Got like a testing?
Good afternoon. We are here to celebrate the launch of the revolutionary educational television series Breaking the Silence. I welcome you all to this auspicious occasion and especially our honored guests, Deputy Minister of Basic Education, Dr. Regina Mhaule, and uh, SABC Board Chairperson, Dr. Bongumusa Makatini. Let's pay tribute to them by putting our hands together. Now, before we go any further, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take you through housekeeping rules. This is a non-smoking venue, so uh, no smoking, obviously, and uh, no eating or drinking is allowed in the venue. The bathrooms are nearest to the bar, and all the emergency exits for this venue are on both sides of the stage. We would like to remind you to please do respect the COVID-19 protocols, like sanitizing your hands, washing them as you leave the bathroom, wearing a mask, and keeping social distance. May I ask that you please stand for the National Anthem of South Africa, followed by the African Union Anthem. At the end of the two anthems, I ask that you kindly remain standing as Mr. Itumeleng Mohanwe from the Pan-African Schools Debating Council leads us in the recital of the preamble of the Constitution. Copies of the preamble, ladies and gents, are on your seats.
of South Africa, I ask that you repeat after me. We, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustices of our past, honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land, respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, and believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. We therefore, through our freely elected representatives, adopt this constitution as the supreme law of the republic, so as to heal the divisions of our past, and establish a society based on democratic values. Social justice and fundamental human rights. Lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. Improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person and build a united and democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the, fa in the family of nations. May God protect our people. Nkosi sigeleli Africa. Mwaka nabuluka se chabasa hesu. God sien seit Africa. God bless South Africa. Mudzimu fatu chedza Afrika. Osi katekisa Afrika. Thank you all very much. You may be seated, please. Two of the most beautiful anthems. They fill me up with pride, and I don't think I speak only for myself, but I think I speak for all of us in this auditorium, and so does the preamble to our unparalleled constitution. 
a constitution that aims to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. Thank you to Mr. Dumeleng Mohanwe of the Pan-African Schools Debating Council. Bahayetu, Lina Gidineo Ranaga, Wanaka no Vukuza, Ukoko Somahashi, standing in front of you. I will be your program director this evening and your proud host of the series. I say proud because the SABC is broadcasting Breaking the Silence at a time when the country is grappling with high levels of teenage pregnancy, HIV infection among girls and boys, gender based violence increasing vulnerability amongst boys, homophobic bullying, violation of trans and intersex children, all of this against the backdrop of the Department of Basic Education's offering of comprehensive sexuality education at schools as part of life orientation to protect and empower children. Now, Breaking the Silence goes way beyond the realm of the conventional. It is a series where traditional Taboo subjects like adolescent sexuality and HIV and AIDS are brought out into the open and dissected through illuminating and challenging programming. Now imagine this, educators, learners and experts all in one room discussing the most effective way of combating the scourge of HIV and AIDS. Comes to mind the quote from very famous American activist, essayist, and novelist, James Baldwin. He says it very well, and he says it all. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. I'm talking about young people taking ownership of their health, as well as their well-being, and understanding and developing mastery to manage the potential impact that HIV AIDS can have on them and their lives. Throughout the 13 episodes of Breaking the Silence, teens are not only given the platform to explore and understand their own value systems regarding sexuality education, so that they are in a position to take and make informed decisions and choices about how they want to live their lives and spend their futures, but also to express how they would like to be taught about sexuality education. It's not as if this issue has not been tackled in schools before, so we aren't really reinventing the wheel. However, because it has, research carried out by the Department of Basic Education has shown that uh, abstinence messages and the current instruction in life orientation sessions at school have clearly not hit home satisfactorily, allowing the HIV virus to run riot amongst the youth with tragic repercussions. And truly, we have to say an intervention is needed. Breaking the Silence, the brainchild of the Department of Basic Education, developed along with Red Pepper Pictures and Ketimpilo, and shifted into reality through the Global Fund, will be broadcast on SABC One in January 2022, the 3rd of January in that year at 4.30 p.m for 13 weeks, that would be 13 episodes. Here's a real taste of what's to come. Take a look. I decided to teach because I really want to make a difference in, in children's lives. I know a lot of adults will say kids never know when they're ready. Learners don't want our opinion. I don't think a lot of learners take the subject seriously. I was taught that sex gives you AIDS. I knew that sex was a bad thing to do. We grew up knowing it is taboo to talk about it. We were a bit shy to hold each other's hand or to kiss each other. A teacher needs to remember that this child needs support. I'm Dino Ranaga. Welcome to Breaking the Silence. This series aims to give our youth a platform to voice their opinions about sexuality and other related concerns, and also encourage our learners to tell their educators how they want to be taught about sexuality. I googled everything I need to know about sex. Yes, I did that. Better than not knowing. My mom does not even want me to speak about it in front of her, so I'd rather open up the dictionary and check it myself. What I found out was quite amazing. Sexual intercourse between two people, et cetera, et cetera. Then I understood from that point onwards. Do any of you know any teen parents? Yes. 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 Really? I was like the perfect child, did nothing wrong. 
and I was top this, top that. So she had uh, high expectations um, of me and she didn't think I would do things like this. It was like even in LO class, when you get to that topic, when it's like sex, you felt that, that for, for most teachers, like, let us just skip it. Should maybe your condom burst while having sex, do you think you might be ready for that consequence? Yeah, pregnancy? No. I think no matter how much we can implement sexual education and no matter how involved we can be in those learners' lives, at the end of the day, we cannot make choices for them. You have to know what you like and dislike. You have to learn how to say no. Now we should look beyond teaching people to abstain because we've tried that method and it clearly has failed. So kids are scared to approach their parents with these kind of things, you know what I'm saying? It is said that for many South African girls, violence and abuse are an inevitable part of their school environment. And then he started to beat me up, grabbed me by my hair, banged my face on the floor. And from then, that's when he started to rape me. It is every teenager's right to feel safe. Mm -hmm. People think mm -hmm. that, oh no, she wears things like that. She's so probably, she deserves it. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was asking for it. She flirted with me, she wanted it. It's important to emphasize that it is not what girls or women wear that leads them to be raped or be sexually violated. It is, in fact, a, what we as men and boys do to women daily in objectifying them or looking at them as just mere sexual objects. Have you drank at school? I was in primary school that time. It's happening in our schools and I'm quite aware of it. Uh, children selling substances. When I took my first pull of weed or my first joint, um, I didn't know that a few years later I'd be living in a crack house with a needle in my arm. When you talk to Lena, sometimes you think you're open enough but at the same time, you're not. As learners, what is it that they must do as educators? I think I'm not going to be able to buy hands. I think I'm not going to be gays and also lesbian. As Bob, the Tanabano and Babo. Right now, we're giving children mixed messages because of our own judgments and biases. And we need to begin to close that gap. I actually want a better future for myself. I truly hope. <laughs> I truly hope that the sensation jerking snippet that you just saw enticed you. And we will be showing later on a full episode, which would be our 10th episode. Um, this was shot four years ago. And to think that content that we shot four years ago is relevant even today. These issues keep growing. And we sit here as adults. Now imagine in a room full of teenagers what stories you might hear of the things that they've been through. In essence, breaking the silence and HIV prevention and sexuality education television program is what we call a docu-reality show where real people take the stage as you've seen. I'd like to call upon stage now Elijah Mthlanga for our welcoming address. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dineo. Um, let me start by greeting the Deputy Minister of Basic Education, Dr. Arjana Mhaule, and um, the UNICEF country representative, Christine Mohigana, the regional advisor for UNESCO, Dr. Patricia Machawira, and our own Dr. Patricia Watson from the Department of Basic Education. I see another doctor over there, Dr. Andy Ledube. And I think I also saw a professor somewhere up there behind me. But we also have a bishop in the house today, uh, Bishop Moyan, and the HOD of uh, Education in Pumalanga, Mrs. Lucy Moyan. And uh, my chief director there, Dr. Tembitula did not forget you as well, CEO of SANEC. We also have representatives from civil society 
and other government departments that are here. Don't worry, if I don't mention your name, you will be mentioned later. There's an item there in the program called Vote of Thanks. <laughs> That's not what I've come to do. So assess me on the basis of my job, which is to conduct a few remarks, basically deliver a few remarks to welcome everyone. And I think I was asked, I, I forget Remy there. In fact, Remy, when we were in Turkey last year, February, uh, DM, it was just Remy Shawa. And in the time that we've had COVID, he has become a doctor. Um, he facilitated a beautiful session there. He's a very good facilitator. I'm sure you'll experience some of his uh, knowledge and skill in this regard. Um, I think I was chosen to deliver the welcome address because I know the building well. <laughs> I, I've worked in this building and I left it. We were here with Hope Mohadla over there. So we know all the tunnels. There's life underneath this floor we are on. <clears throat> and we know the tunnels to the TV center as well, the dungeons and all these other places. So I think, and it was, the SABC was my last employer before I joined the department. So I know both organizations. And let me start by breaking my own silence. Uh, for the past four years, I have been harassed by none other than Liko Botoman himself. He has been harassing me, and it's time for me to break the silence. <laughs> I think from today he will be able to sleep. He even left the department, by the way, for a year, and he came back to find that breaking the silence was still not on air. It was waiting for him to come back. And when he was given this responsibility, he was a, a branch coordinator in the department, responsible for a whole range of issues that the chief director, Mr. Love over there, and others who have left were responsible for. And when he came back, he was then made a director. So for this day to come today, he had to be promoted to be given the authority to run with this project for it to be a success. And I think there's a lesson there for managers. Ne? So if you give someone a responsibility, give them the authority to make it happen. That's it. Um, I think that we all have heard what Dino just said now, that we shot this series four years ago, and the content remains relevant today. But the most important thing about it is that parents are going to be challenged quite a bit because we got frustrated at some point when trying to communicate what comprehensive sexuality education is all about. We even had to go to take with Remy last year to just find out what are other countries doing and how are they communicating this thing we found that the challenges are the same. The response of the parents is the same. It doesn't matter where you go. And we as communicators, and Hope will tell you this, even more faith, that every time when we share in public the things that children are doing, parents don't believe it. They don't believe it. They say no. You can't be talking to my child about this. I have the right. I gave birth to this child. And yet, just a little bit that you've had, you had there gives you a sense of the things that children already know and the things that they don't know. And it, I think, for me, the most important thing, it exposes the gap that exists between children and their parents, the lack of communication. So we trust that with this particular project, 13 weeks, but a lot can be achieved in 13 weeks. And we believe we will be able to do that. We have been continually trying to find alternative ways of communicating the same messages. But this is one thing that we had not done. 
and today we are here to unveil uh, breaking the silence and we hope that it will communicate differently it will reach parents it will convey messages that we have not been able to convey and how best do you do that i mean you come to the biggest channel in the land sbc one and we appreciate the partnership that uh, exists between us and the SABC as an organization, but with SABC Education in particular, and this time around with SABC One for this particular initiative. We are really, really grateful. It's not easy to make it to SABC One. It's really not easy. So uh, those who are in the industry will know that for you to secure time on SABC One, you would have had to do a lot of work. So these four years, it wasn't just four years of us doing nothing. There was a lot that was being done. But the greatest thing is that we are here today to unveil this series, and we welcome each and every one of you. We know that there are others who are watching on the social media platforms. We welcome all of you as well. Please share the link. Please help us promote it. We have our team of influencers out there, the MTV Sugar team. They are out there promoting it. The DBE social media team is there as well. And we thank each and everyone who is in this auditorium this afternoon. And please work with us as we take you through the program. Every part of the program is really important. It was packaged so that we're able to communicate exactly what this particular program is all about. Thank you so much. Mr. Mshanga Siabonga. I'm, I'm, I'm just compelled, just by a show of hands, how many of us in the room are parents? Qu quite a number of us, isn't it? How many of us in the room have been comfortable to speak about sex ed with our children? I'll put a half a hand up. Well, you're far better than I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. I still struggle with it, and this is on the back of what Ubabam Tlanga was saying, that there's a gap. And I think with breaking the silence, there's an opportunity to slowly see the gap close between parents and children and what they need to know and hear from us as their parents, Ababa uh, Zalile. A live performance now by the Mzansi Orchestra Ensemble. They will be performing Wa Kwazula and Kwela. Do enjoy.
MC tonight, so uh, we just want a va va voom. <laughs> Breaking the silence must also break this spiritual silence. Yes. And now, it's Sunday afternoons are Township Quella moments, Ekasi. So, a bit of Township Quella, and then we continue with Breaking the Silence. We chase it up now. Zanzi Orchestra Ensemble. One last round of applause, please. Thank you. We thank you for the music. It's very therapeutic, particularly on a Sunday. Thank you so much. We appreciate it quite a lot. So the Department of Basic, uh, Basic Education has developed some advocacy video material. Uh, it's linked to the Breaking the Silence series. This is to communicate the work undertaken in uh, the development of scripted lesson plans, and this is to aid the delivery of comprehensive sexuality education in life orientation, and the role that society can play in advancing violence prevention and child protection. Ladies and gents, your eyes to the screen, please. As a nation, we are confronted with very serious problems affecting our children ongoing infections of HIV and AIDS, unplanned and unintended pregnancy, child molestation, women abuse. Let's talk about it and deal with it. It is important that we confront it as honestly as possible and as bravely as possible. Let's do it. It's good for us and it's good for our country. I am a nurturer like you. you. Real men stand against gender-based violence. I get hurt, like you. If I am a victim of violence, I too will not be ashamed to report violence and abuse. I hate it when someone violates me, like you. In a violent situation, there is power in walking away. I will not take part in fights at school. All I want is to feel safe, to feel loved, and to be free to show love, like you. I cry when I'm hurt. Because to feel is to be human. I pledge to be more open about my emotions. Make it part of the new normal for young boys to be nurtured and loved, to freely express themselves and to show love in a safe, inclusive way. We have different gender identities, but first, we are human. If you need assistance to help your child, contact Childline on 08000 555 5. Violence and sexual abuse against children has become a major social challenge during the COVID-19 lockdown. We appeal to adults, parents and caregivers to be kind towards children during this lockdown and beyond. 
give children the space they need to engage with their reading and learning activities. Do not hit them. Do not yell at them. They are equally frustrated. We urge you to listen, support and help the children to survive the COVID-19 lockdown. Report immediately any incident of sexual abuse. The Department of Basic Education. Every child is a national asset. The Department of Basic Education is currently piloting the use of scripted lesson plans in the life orientation curriculum in school, including a section on comprehensive sexuality education. Not to be confused with sex education, CSE is a process of teaching and learning about the cognitive, emotional, physical and social aspects of sexuality within the curriculum. The only thing that my mother told me was that don't play with boys. If only the parents could understand that these people are human beings and they're developing and they're growing and they're developing emotionally, physically, mentally. They want to experiment. Through CSE, we give learners scientifically accurate, age-appropriate and culturally relevant content to equip them with knowledge, skills, attitudes and values that will empower them to realize their health, well-being and dignity. The LO curriculum has not changed and the scripted lesson plan pilot in five provinces will continue in 2020. The Department of Basic Education. Every child is a national asset. Ladies and gentlemen, now the moment we've all been waiting for. The show was shot four years ago. In four years, I have truly matured. I'm by far from where I used to be. And I've been fondly grown to be known as Oso Modona on Metro FM. And I hope in my dress code today, and my pink hair, I stand for the youth that they can still trust me with their stories as their older sister and that I'm still on their level and I can still relate to their stories and their, their life experiences. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, these are some of the platforms that hook young people. They really occupy quite a lot of their time and I see this through my son. It's impossible to manage his screen time. He's really there, and when I do want to step in to manage his screen time, it's a fight in the household. The trouble is that, you know, there are many totally unaware, most of them, they're not aware of the consequences of their online and digital interactions. In this episode, which is episode 10 of Breaking the Silence, both learners and educators discover how their online behavior and attitudes can scar guileless youngsters for life. This is the moment, a full length episode shot four years ago, and we are all so proud of it. We do hope you enjoy. Let's go. I decided to teach because I really want to make a difference in, in children's lives. I know a lot of adults will say kids never know when they're ready. Learners don't want our opinion. I don't think a lot of learners take the subject seriously. I was taught that sex gives you AIDS. I knew that sex was a bad thing to do. We grew up knowing it is taboo to talk about it. We were a bit shy to hold each other's hand or to kiss each other. A teacher needs to remember that this child needs support. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. These are just a few of the digital and online platforms which our youth interact with. A lot of their time is spent in a cyber world where there's no physical contact with the people or the characters they engage with. According to a study done by the Center of Justice and Crime Prevention in 2016, 85% of learners used online instant messaging as the most preferred method of communication. Today on Breaking the Silence, we give learners and educators tools for engaging responsibly on social and digital media. Joining us today is Nombeli Sombanga, a teen coaching expert who is also known as a youth alchemist. She'll be watching the learners' discussion backstage with our panel of educators. Hi, I'm Johan. I'm a life orientation teacher for grade 11, so I also teach Afrikaans grade 8 and 9. I am Peli Mbelelapi Sarakhobe. I teach at Lishabile High School. My name is Mohamed Beliz. I'm a teacher at Prosperitas Secondary School. Teaching LO is informative. You get to help learners. You get to, to, to interact with learners, counsel them in a way as well. And that's where you get to understand what your learners are feeling in, in a way. The reason why I like to teach life orientation is because of the reason you can be open to learners and they can, can come to you with problems and yeah, you can help them. I actually act as a social worker of the school because 
Whenever they have problems, they would come to me. They understand me, I understand them. Today, our panel of learners are Bongani, Shani, Anthony, Zanda, Yongama, Itumeleng. Welcome to Breaking the Silence. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it so much. How are you guys feeling? Uh, good. 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 You're feeling good. Fantastic. So we're talking social media and all sorts of other things that happen on social media. Cyberbullying, texting, sexting, I think it's called, right? Yes. And um, all bunches of things. Social media, why do we want to be on social media so badly? Why is it so important to us? It's because we can communicate to a lot of people, people we don't know, close friends, people we don't see every day. Yeah. And also relatives. And also relatives. And your relationship with social media, do you have social media? Yes, yes, I do. What social media do you have? Instagram and Facebook. Instagram and Facebook. Yes. Why do we post on social media? What are we looking for? What do we want? What's this addiction to social media? Maybe it's the attention you get from all the likes and the comments and everything ah, you get. Ah, do yeah. you think we've become a society that's living for likes? Yes. yes. So if we don't get likes, does it affect you if you post something and you don't get likes? I think sometimes it does mm. because then you feel like, oh, uh, that girl gets like 300 likes and I only get three. Yeah. Then, oh, uh, she's more prettier than me. I need to do something, lose weight, or I need to wear more makeup or something wow. like that. How many people do you know that like literally do insane things just for likes? A lot. <laughs> what kind of insane things do they do? Uh, some, some people are not ashamed of posting their naked pictures, just. not even half naked, naked pictures on social media. Teenagers? Yes, mm. because... Really? If you check, uh, some girls have uh, Kim Kardashian as a role model. And she posts our dear daughters. Amazing. <laughs> so they think that posting naked pictures can make them a better person in life. Very true. What our role model is saying about problem, the our children. Our problems nowadays. is that we don't. They don't take us as their, as their role, role models. models. There are people they take as role models, no. and those people do wrong things. Have you guys received nudies on your social media? Yes. You have. Yes. Really? What did you do with the nudes? Did you show your friends? No, I don't. Like, if it's between us, it will stay between us. But, like, I didn't ask for it. it just Where? Was this on Facebook, on WhatsApp? No, WhatsApp. Yeah, in most cases, girls who want attention from boys, they usually do that. They send nude pictures to boys and, and seeking attention. Teenagers have access to smartphones, which lead them to have access to the internet and then porn. So often when, when kids are at school, they want to explore the different things that, they, that land into their phones. And that leads to them experimenting with nudes and sending stuff to each other. And the assumption is that it's only girls who do that. But more, in most cases, also boys send nudes to girls, even sometimes without even asking for permission. The challenging part with teens is that they can send nudes to each other, which then leads to them um, bullying each other by leaking information to other people within the school. So the challenge is for teens to understand how to manage their digital space in a way that's going to protect themselves within the school environment. Then I delete it because like... And what if you forget to delete and your mom gets a hold of your phone and it's like full of nudes? <laughs> what would your dad do? <laughs> My dad will beat me. Really? Yeah. Doesn't play? Doesn't play. Your parents and your relationship with your phones do you have boundaries for your parents where your phones are concerned? Can your parents go through your phones? Do you allow them to? I don't. You don't? Why? My parents trust me, so they don't, they don't feel the need to go through my things. Itumeleng? Yes. Yes. Itumeleng. Exactly what is in your phone that would drive your mom crazy? Uh, yes. I have many girlfriends. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. Why do you have many girlfriends? I don't know. Some are like my friends, you know. Yeah. And some are like my girlfriends. How many are like <laughs> your girlfriends? Only two for now. <laughs> are you planning on having more? No. But ish, they are becoming more. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to be having many, 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 many girlfriends at that age especially because then eventually you're gonna want it to take to the next level and it's gonna lead into many 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 different problems for him sexting is a big trend do you guys do the sexting thing 
I wouldn't say I do sexting. I just flirt. Yeah. You just flirt. flirt. What's the difference between flirting and sexting? Flirting is nice comments. Yeah. And then sexting is naughty, nasty, nasty yeah. comments. Like what? <laughs> Construct a sexting sentence for me. What are you wearing now? <laughs> is that sexting? <laughs> it's not sexting, but then yeah. it, leads to it leads to sexting. It leads to sexting. I'm actually from an old school era, so sexting is a new <laughs> concept to me. So flirting for me would be, hi, how are you doing? I like you kind of vibe. Sexting would then be where you ask, what are you doing? What are you wearing? Can I get a picture? I think that's where the line would be drawn. I met Johnny, uh, so happened that he also lived across the road from me. He was incredibly charming, older, witty. My daughter was 14 when he set out to get her to really like him. It created lots of conflict and I, I began to really struggle with discipline. I discovered that he'd been in touch with her on Facebook, sending her inappropriate messages um, about sex and about them discussing sex with each other. Little did I know at the time that he had provided her with a cell phone which she hid. She was in touch with him all the time. She was still in her school uniform, searched her pockets, and we found a little cell phone. And on it contained messages telling her exactly what to tell the police. We handed the, the actual device, the cell phone, in for forensics. She said to me, Mum, I really need an iPad for school. And she made me serious, big promises. I just want to get through school. I'm not going to do anything wrong. I'm going to stay away from him. And I had to get an iPad because the schools implemented iPad learning. Very soon after that, I discovered messages between him being in touch with her. He had set up two fake profiles and use those to communicate with her and him requesting that she send photographs of her body to him. She's in love with him. She couldn't live without him because she always found a way. He always found a way. Social media is everywhere, so no matter how hard I tried to keep my daughter safe, I could take away her a phone, but she'd go to school and there'd be somebody there with social media, with Skype, with a phone. I think there are no boundaries to social media because you can create an anonymous platform, uh, anonymous profile. You can go online and open an account and say you're a different sex, you're older than you are. There's no laws governing it and protecting children. It's quite frightening how vulnerable social media makes us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it doesn't only make affect us that are using it, but also th our loved ones. How do you think the lady in our insert could have been helped? I feel like she could have moved away if it was really that bad because like they always find a way to talk to each other. Mm. So like maybe if she has another family member, other family members, she could have stayed there for a while to meet someone else. Maybe it would have helped. Mm -hmm. I think that taking her phone was not the best thing to do because she could go to a friend and use his or her phone. Mm. I think a mother should have spoken to her and showed the, the right way and the consequences of being with this man. Why do we take phones to school? Why can't we leave our phones at home? Is it important for us to take our phones to school? I don't think it's important. You don't think it's important? No. Taking your phone to school may limit your focus in, in your books mm -hmm. because during the period you may be at the back of the class and then using your cell phone instead of listening in class. Mm -hmm. We do not allow them to bring uh, uh, phones to school. Once you find you find it, you get it, you take it to the office, and they get no. it at the end of the year when the school closes. Do you guys have private accounts, or are they open for the public? Open. Open. Open? My Instagram is private, but my Why is Facebook's your Instagram private? Because I don't like people gawking at my photos and stuff, so I just keep it private, and then the close friends who I accept is the ones that can see my stuff. I think they're not aware that these things can be hacked. And, and once they are hacked, the people who get the information can, can be after them. What's the worst thing that you think can happen to you if you were to 
make your social media platform not so private? People can see uh, your location, uh, mm -hmm. what you like, mm -hmm. so it's easy for someone to find you. Mm, never mm. thought about it that way. Yeah, right? Yeah. Right? Sexual predators are out there, pedophiles are out there, and the more you basically advertise yourself on media platforms and whatever, the more trouble you're going to get and how more people's going to target you. Would you agree that social media is faceless? Yes, because you don't know who's behind that profile. Let's say I'm 64. I can say that I'm 17 years old. Mm -hmm. I steal pictures from other boys and post it in mm -hmm. my wall. And then people think that I'm that person. I see a nice profile. I send an, a friend request. She accepts. We chat, we chat, we chat. Ask to meet and eventually find uh, that I'm chatting to a guy. Have you, in all honesty, visited any pornography sites out of interest via your phone? Mine was an accident, yeah. One was by accident? Yes. I like your honesty, and you? No. No? No. No? Nope. No? No. No? No. no. Please don't tell me you've never watched pornography in your whole life. You can go on the internet, a pop-up can come, and you can actually, when you try to close it, it comes, it goes to the full-blown website. So that's how they, no, I think they lied over there. <laughs> if you go in Tubity, ne? Yeah. It kicks like Tubity out and goes on a porn site. And this is supposed to be like a, 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 um, a user-friendly friendly, yes. application. But now it's not anymore. So did you delete Tubity from your phone? Yes. Let's see how easily accessible is pornography to no. a, a child. Mm. He types in a music website and then it kicks him off into a porn Pop website. Yeah. It's, it's on the World Wide Web. How do you police the World Wide Web? Have you guys had an incident at school where a sex tape went viral amongst your, your, your um, schoolmates? Yes. Yeah. And what was, uh, yeah, how did that turn out? It turned out really bad because teachers got involved and those learners were called for a disciplinary hearing and parents were also involved. What role do our parents play um, in our social media behavior? Our parents are not, uh, they don't have social media. So when we are older, we can get involved in our children's social media because yeah. we know how it works. Do we put boundaries when we use social media? Because I know with my social media, I'm like, hey, whatever, let's all go, let's rock and roll. But sometimes people have really mean things to say. I know I've been called, I don't know how, how ugly, I've been called ugly a thousand and one times on social media. Does that count as cyberbullying? Yes. 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 Is there a way we can stop cyberbullying? I don't think there's a way you can stop it. You can just yeah. ignore it because like, everybody's gonna have their opinion about yeah. you. So there's nothing you can do about it. Do you guys know anyone who's been cyber bullied and that's had a bad impact on their lives? I think my, my nephew, mm -hmm. I can not get 12 years old, he's in my three years. And I think from there, if my friends are being bullied over the phone, and because he had an epileptic attack, he couldn't get my three years old. So he couldn't finish his matric? Yes. And because of the cyberbullying? Yes. And he tried to suicide. He tried to commit suicide? Yes. Say that in Afrikaans. Uh, yeah. uh, self -murplug. Yeah. By drinking all his pills and all that. Really? That just breaks my heart, man. Hmm. That just really breaks my heart. He was teased over something he can't change about himself. An illness that he didn't choose for himself. Yeah. Cyberbullies or any kind of bullies will target you because you're different. Ik is Ander Gringling. Um, ik is 18, 18 jaar oud, 4 jaar op 4 september. Ik ga naar school bij Oorschool Roerpoort. Die gebied waar ons in blij is baie lekker. I use Facebook en WhatsApp when I have data. <laughs> Every morning I check when Shani is messaging me or when friends have gone somewhere and want to go somewhere, then I check where we can go or something like that. The dislikes wat ik like van social media is Mensen kan buy van een nieuwe Facebook en hack of je WhatsApp of in je phone even. En een geval is met mij gebeurd. Ik heb al drie keer meer dan vier Facebook accounts en dat dan al vier van mijn Facebook accounts gehack. Ik denk het is makkelijker om voor iemand op Facebook iets te posten en om te tag. Jij gaat niet zijn reactie zien. Je gaat niet vinden het voelt niet. Ik denk het is maar net die reactie wat de mensen gaan krijgen. How do we speak about such things at school to educate other people that you actually do have 
the power to make or break someone. It's okay if you don't have an answer. We've got our educators watching in the next room. And when we come back, uh, we're going to call our educators in and we're going to expand the conversation with them. You good with that? Yes. yes. Fantastic. We'll be right back. Under the watchful eye of our expert, Nomveli, so I'm going to open up the floor for our educators as well as our learners to have a healthy discussion around today's subject, social media, the dangers of it, and how it's very distracting and disruptive in our lives. How do we create boundaries that keep our children safe? The boundaries that we need to create are as parents and teachers playing a role together. We need to, to monitor our kids' interaction into social media. How do we monitor that and create that as a boundary without infringing on their boundaries of privacy? Because, I mean, they're young adults, mm. you know, mm. I mean, they've got rights as well for, to privacy. Monitor while educating, not uh, sit there now with their phone every time, let me see what you're chatting, let me see mm -hmm. what you're typing. No, no, mm -hmm. no. In an in a educational manner, mm -hmm. where you'll still be educating them about what, how should they conduct themselves on social media. Mm -hmm. Are you guys still okay on the internet? You're not posting revealing stuff about yourself. Mm -hmm. and you're not putting too much of yourself out there. You almost need to know how to build your own boundaries as a teenager. Mm -hmm. As in, know what, when you're angry, how you react to things. What I find with teens is that because they're still growing emotionally, often you don't know how to build, um, how to check first if this is going to be appropriate for me to post or not. And that's how mostly teens get into trouble. Same way when you know that at home there are problems or challenges at home, you're feeling lonely, you're feeling sad. It's easy for you to be lured into pedophiles mm, because mm. you have this emotional gap that you're going through. And the safest way is to then have someone around you that you trust, that you can talk to. So what support structures do we have at our schools, ma'am, that when a child has been cyberbullied, because um, we're not just focusing on, on, on graphic images being posted or sexting um, between boyfriend and girlfriend, but now what about those that get cyberbullied? I think our problem is that we don't have structures in place. We rush to finish the syllabus and forget that we've got learners who need to be coached. I think for me what's interesting is that um, even, even besides being cyberbullied, I know one of my teens once, um, he had a, a, a smartphone and mm. he was on Facebook. He never actually logged out from his phone. So one of his friends took the phone and was sending people rude stuff. Um, and sometimes we, we forget that sometimes when you boys play, you play rough. Mm. And <laughs> so you take those games and you make them rough. So he almost had to find a way to change his password again, mm. log out from the phone, and then, you know, apologize to everyone. And it was difficult for people to even believe him because mm. he had sent so many messages. Mm. So I think it also goes with knowing how to use your smartphones properly and know how to manage the security checks mm. in them. Do they understand and do you talk to them about the sharing of personal information on, on, on setting up an account on social media? Because sometimes you're asked very personal questions for security reasons, so they say, mm -hmm. but is it really secure? My personal opinion, nothing is secure on the internet. Yeah. Anybody can get access to your accounts, we get hackers. Mm -hmm. Even if, for instance, if you have an iPhone, everything they say on the cloud, and you mm -hmm. get people that can hack into the cloud and they can spread every little thing that's on your phone mm -hmm. through the World Wide Web. Mm. So, mm. my personal opinion, nothing is safe. Nothing safe on the internet, mm. right? So, my dear learners, there are so many dangers on social media. And you go to school every day, you interact with your LO teachers all the time. How would you like them to teach you about these dangers on social media? I think, like, if they made an example in class, like, if they made an example account in class to show you which information they ask you to put in, mm. I think it would help as well. Mm -hmm. Some of the learners, think it's a joke, they laugh about it because it's not something the teacher is supposed to talk about to the learners. About. Mm. And while I was um, going through the lesson, I actually asked a few learners, uh, whose phone can I take now and go through your gallery? And nobody raised their hands. Is that a sign of... That there's something this, this, going will on. Will smoke this fire? There's something yes, going exactly. on. Yeah, see, that behavior frightens me. I don't want to yes, lie. Does. Like, if you are so apprehensive mm. at a young age to hand over your phone, mm. to say, yeah, but you can go through my phone, it's okay. Mm. But the moment you go, no, and you're like under the age of 18, yeah. what are you hiding mm. on your phone? Exactly. This is where self-control comes in. As a teenager, you have to know that some things 
you don't do. Some things you can do. Some mm. things you use them to do this, and some things you use them to do that. Mm. So you have to set boundaries for yourself. Know what's right and what's wrong. I was very happy when uh, one of the other learners was saying they have to be responsible. Texting is there, cyberbullying is there, whatever is there, but they themselves have to be responsible for their own actions. And that's very mature and very responsible for you to respond in this manner, would mm. you agree? I agree. Um, it also means that the teenagers themselves must understand their value while they are at school. And I know it sounds cliche because you're there to be educated and, 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 and. But the truth is that when you're at school, your academics is your responsibility in terms of how you perform in your academics, what you achieve when you leave high school and how you take yourself to university or tertiary or any kind of tertiary institution. So if you're gonna spend most of your time wasting your hours at school, you are the only one who's responsible for that outcome and nobody else. Often it's easier for teens to, to blame the teachers, to blame the government, mm. to blame the system, to blame the parents that, oh, my mom did not buy me a tablet, or oh, I've got a tablet but I've got no data on my tablet. But um, teens need to remember their own responsibility for their mm. own lives. Mm. Same thing with um, using the smartphone to get the right information out of it. Because then what's the point of you having all of these digital appliances and yet you are still failing in school mm. where you could be using that to kind of Empower yourself, yourself right? absolutely. Yeah. Well, there we go. I think the, the, we're leaving with the sense of acknowledging that it is your responsibility as a person, be you educator or learner, to conduct yourself in a principled way when um, engaging with other people on social media. Mr. Mohammed said, nothing is safe on social media, mm. and the internet forgets nothing. Be careful what you post. At least now we know a little better than we did before we started talking. Thank you. Yes. Educators, build confidence and self-esteem in learners and stand against cyberbullying. Parents, become technologically informed. Learners, choose carefully what you post. With our legislation still in progress with protecting our children from the dangers of engaging on social and digital media, there is no harm with giving our learners the tools they need to protect themselves. I hope today's episode helped you at home to navigate safely through the virtual world we often engage in. I'm Dino Ranaga. Make sure to tune in next week for another edition of Breaking the Silence. been more proud in all honesty four years later I'm seeing for the first time like yourselves an episode of what we shot four years later I am hearing for the first time because it's like an out-of-body experience right that our youth is smarter than we give them credit for really we ought to trust them a round of applause well done they truly are smarter than what we give them credit for. And also congratulations to you, SABC Education, for picking a fine one. Well done on commissioning this, on licensing this, whichever way you went. Well done to the Department of Basic Education, the production houses involved. And there's just some special spiritual alignment with having shot it four years ago as a basic Dineo, now coming four years later as Osi Omodona. So I'm literally their older sister. It's insane. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what breaking the silence is all about. I just want to be in the spirit of the moment and please join me. Viva breaking the silence. Viva. So child protection is not a one-dimensional responsibility of the DBE. Other partners and stakeholders are involved. UNESCO has supported the DBE in its endeavors to strengthen 
S CSE rather as a game changer in the prevention of HIV, early unintended pregnancies as well as gender-based violence. I now hand over to Dr. Remy Shawa, Program Officer for East and Southern Africa Region and Deputy Country Focal Point for South Africa at UNESCO. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Danell. Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, let me just uh, write on the protocol that uh, Elijah uh, gave earlier and say all protocol observed. My name is Remy Shaw, I'm from UNESCO and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Elijah, when we last met, uh, one thing that you probably didn't know now is that we were blessed with a third child during the lockdown. So <laughs> Thank you. And I'm carefully saying, you know, we're blessed with the third child during, the child was not conceived during lockdown, so let us, uh, <laughs> we were not that busy. Um, so I have here, you know, some colleagues that we work with on a daily basis to really help reflect on what we've just watched earlier. I'll start uh, with my immediate left here is Ms. Nomvaliso Mbanga, who's the teen coach. Let us give her a round of applause. We have Ms. Sipokazi Novukuza, who is uh, from the Digital Technologies Department. Let us give her a round of applause. And then my far left, we have Christine Mahigana, who is the UNICEF uh, resident representative. Let us give her a round of applause as well. And to my right, we have the two chief directors at the Department of Basic Education, Dr. Patricia Watson here on my immediate right. Let us give her a round of applause, please. And we have Ms. Toteka Noguduka, also the chief director, right there at the far end. Let us give her a round of applause. And I think there's something that I got from you know, the episode that we watched and that this issue of... Uh, Social media and digital security and safety is not just an issue for learners and young people, but parents as well, as well as uh, educators, as well as the elders in the communities. And like you said, you know, they know so much, they are so smart, and there's so much that we can learn from them. I want to start off by asking uh, Toteka, uh, what is the Department of Basic Education doing to digitize comprehensive sexuality education and make it accessible uh, for young people and, and children uh, on the digital space. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Remy, for that question. Um, as DBE, we were also caught uh, with COVID-19, uh, like the rest of the world and the rest of the country. And as we were responding as a country to COVID-19, we had to lock down the schools. And that gave us an opportunity to think as the department, how do we ensure that we continue providing comprehensive sexuality education to our learners? We've seen that during lockdown, our learners were much more exposed to gender-based violence and sexual exploitation. We've seen our learners um, left without care and support uh, that those needs um, clinical uh, uh, services. We've seen our learners not being able to access um, sexual and reproductive health services um, that they used to access when they were at school. So as the department, uh, we took an opportunity. You might say um, we, we were forward-looking or forward-thinking. Um, as you heard, that Breaking the Silence started to be developed four years ago. So that is one platform. We've partnered with our partners, especially around television, to look at what programs can be played during this time. Breaking Silence will be starting, yeah, it's one of them, but we've also looked at other programs that are on air that are South, Af South African based. Um, Soul City is our partner, Love Life is our partner, and SAPC in general, um, we've partnered with them to look at programs that we can implement. We've, we've also in the digitalization process um, took some of the scripted lessons and put them into radio lessons. Um, so that we can also be able to, while we are digitalizing, but also be able to close the digital divide amongst the South African communities. Those that don't have access to television, those that don't have access to internet, they continue to have access to radio. 
We are also going to be starting looking at the social media platforms as well to try and make sure that we continue making these um, uh, lessons available. But also we need to keep in mind that um, comprehensive sexuality education is part of the curriculum. Therefore, our content, we have to align it to be age appropriate, culture appropriate, as well as content appropriate in terms of what are we giving our learners, how are we empowering them, and what do we want to, to see um, in the future as we continue uh, to give them the lessons. We have met with challenges, um, some of it highlighted um, on, on breaking the silence, but um, I think that is work that um, my colleague here, Dr. Patricia Watson, is responsible for. Thanks very much, Dr. Romy. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, indeed, you're right. Uh, you were forward thinking as a department as a, and as a country. I sit at the regional level, so I get to see what's happening in other countries. And a lot of eyes are on South Africa to see how you know um, you digitize CSE. Uh, the breaking the silence is something that a lot of countries are waiting to uh, to see as well. So thank you so much for sharing those lessons. Let me come to to you, Dr. Patricia. So here's the challenge that young people are facing, right? On one hand, there is the fourth industrial revolution. They cannot do without, you know, the technology and, you know, the digital world, the internet of things. But at the same time, we want to keep them safe. So how is the department responding to the issue of digital safety among uh, adolescents, young people, and children? Thanks, Remy. I, we've got three words at play here. Responsibly, accountably, and ethically. These three words drive <clears throat> the department's e-safety guidelines, which support managers in schools to ensure that they establish accessible use policies. And these accessible use policies alert learners to the, the threats of uh, uh, sexual harassment online, they also um, draw their attention to the harmful impact of cyberbullying, as well as copyright and the infringement of that uh, through the way in which we use information on the internet, and that we don't plagiarize when we do use the information on the internet. And what the children are um, able to do is to link this accessible use policy at a school level to their own code of conduct in the school. So what we do is we, through the e-safety guidelines that were uh, renewed and launched in 2017 at the same time of doing Breaking the Silence, was that uh, children know that if they do cyberbully, that there will be consequences. And what is really encouraging is that our partners have joined the sector to support us to give expression to our goal in the action plan towards the realization of Schooling 2030 to support teachers, to assist them to professionalize and to get them on board in terms of ICT and the use of ICTs in education. And one of the uh, mechanisms that the department really uh, puts a, a lot of weight behind is this idea of lesson sets. So we've got comprehensive sexuality lesson sets and in the cyber safety space, we've also got a collection of lesson sets that we've developed in partnership with Google. Um, they joined the sector to understand what does it mean to support lessons for learners from grade eight to grade 12. And we cover topics like keeping yourself safe online, keeping your account safe, um, as well as being a, a respectable digital citizen and also being future ready. So you started this by asking me what are the three words. The three words are they must be responsible citizens, accountable citizens, and ethical citizens if they're going to take their place in a world that requires them to be collaborative, to communicate well, and to be creative because AI is going to take the automated jobs and the future for children um, when they grow up is going to be in how they can uh, communicate well and create um, new ways of seeing the world. And they will take their parents with them. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Patricia. Um, I think, yes, we cannot deny the fact that the future 
uh, young people today need to be prepared for the future and that, you know, even the future of work will significantly change. Um, can I come to you, Christine? Uh, I know that one of the key mandates of UNICEF is child protection. What is UNICEF doing to support the Department of Basic Education in providing comprehensive sexuality education as well as child protection? Thank you very much, Remy, and um, thank you for um, the organization of this beautiful event, and congratulations to the Department of Basic Education under your able uh, leadership, Deputy Minister, for uh, producing uh, such a, a brilliant uh, series. I, uh, I'm sure um, it will have uh, an impact, as uh, we heard earlier. Uh, it's been four years, uh, and the, the, the conversations, the, uh, the messages, the challenges, the issues remain very much um, uh, up to date, and um, we, we, need, we need these kinds of things to be um, available for, for the country. So, Remy, what is uh, UNICEF doing um, to support the Department of Basic Education? As you said, we are a, an organization that um, supports both education and uh, child protection um, uh, issues uh, in, the, uh, in the program that we support in, uh, in South Africa. So, for example, um, earlier this week, uh, we supported the uh, organization of a conference on comprehens comprehensive sexual education, which brings together uh, practitioners, experts, um, educa ed educators, the department itself, to look at what's working, what's happening, um, what are the challenges, so that lessons are learned. Um, if there were evaluations, they inform how the department plans, the department allocates its resources, and the department makes sure that um, the, uh, the, the initiatives that uh, Patricia was talking about continue to be relevant and address the issues that um, the children face and uh, educators face in, uh, in dealing with comprehensive sexual education. So, you know, convening, bringing people together so that uh, we look at what's, what's working, so that the planning, the programming, uh, the implementation of, uh, of the initiatives are, are done in a way uh, that's informed um, by, uh, by knowledge, by evidence. Another thing that we do, um, uh, Remy, is develop uh, toolkits, um, training material uh, for professionals in the social service um, um, space uh, for educators. We just did that in uh, Eastern Cape, where um, 200 educators, 300 um, social, social work professionals were trained in um, online uh, platforms, uh, because as we, we saw, it, it takes for um, educators, social workers, to actually be themselves literate about um, uh, the internet, the, the social media, so that they can, a, a, you know, uh, in turn, protect uh, children that they interact with um, in terms of how they, uh, they deal with the um, uh, with online platforms. So they need to be educated about them, and they also need to know the risks so that um, they're able to, to pick up signs of anxiety, of issues, um, of cyberbullying um, uh, that takes place in the, uh, in, the, in the school, in the school space or around the schools, uh, so that they can be supportive to, um, uh, to the children, to the learners. We actually heard one of the uh, the educators in the um, in the series uh, that we just watched, she was saying that it's you're not just there as an educator to uh, provide the, the the learning. We need you need to be attentive. You need to know what's going on and be able to uh, uh, to refer uh, a child that uh, that needs support. Um, be it you know for um, dealing with uh, cyberbullying, for example. Uh, or even just um, you know discomfort, um, mental mental ill illness, uh, if uh, that's the uh, consequence of uh, being um, exposed to uh, harmful or, or, or negative um, online um, interaction. There are 
round of applause. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Christine. Uh, you, you know, I always tell folks that as parents, we need to be attentive as well to what children say, the questions they ask. There are so many clues they give you in just the simple questions they ask you. But, you know, often parents are busy, you, you know, you want to attend to something else. But really, there's an opportunity there to engage further. Um, can I come to you, uh, Nomvaliso, and just uh, hear your views? And Danielle kind of asked that question in the video. You know, there's privacy, right, that adolescents and young people want to protect, and, you know, they have the rights to privacy. How do you balance that um, as a parent to ensure that you kind of negotiate uh, you know, <laughs> providing the kind of support you need to give to the to the to the children, but at the same time, uh, respecting the their privacy. Um, Maleni, um, um, it's been four years. I'm also laughing. It's been four years since we did um, the recording, and nothing has changed, even on the privacy side of things. Teens are still fighting for their privacy. Parents are fighting for teens to not have their privacy, and it's a war zone in the sense that teens have now discovered that they can actually delete history and remove apps and um, go around the family app and hide their stuff very, very well. Um, and as such, control doesn't work in the privacy space because parents often go for control. They want to control what the teens do. They want to control their cell phones. They want to control how they spend their time, and it doesn't work. What works best is negotiating with your child. Negotiate, show them how the things work. Choose which app they must be part of. Don't say, I do not want you there, because they will create false accounts. They do. 90% of teens that are on social media, be it you like it or not, they're there. Negotiate, be open, talk about your own issues about social media, and negotiate with them. Wow. Thank mm. you. <laughs> that's, uh, that's really, uh, really insightful. And the fact that uh, there was one learner that said, um, most parents are not on social media, and that you know, when they become parents themselves, they'll be on social media, it tells you something as well that you know you can't just uh, say no, no to this because they already know a lot of things and they are in these spaces and we need to negotiate. Um, let me uh, jump uh, to you, uh, Sipokazi, and, and just uh, ask the question around the considerations uh, for impacting on children uh, in the cyber security and operations of the Department uh, of Communications and Digital Technologies. What, what are you prioritizing and how are you <laughs> navigating that space? It's tough. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, while Remu was making babies, I was joining the department. Uh, I, <laughs> I joined the department in April, level five lockdown, and it was hectic. So one of the responsibilities that I have, I am the director of cybersecurity operations responsible for the cybersecurity hub, uh, which I know 10 or 20% of South Africans know about, which is one of the things we are still trying to deal with so that people are aware of what we do there. But one of the projects that I found that I needed to take over was the cybersecurity awareness, awareness sorry, school toolkit which was developed in partnership with the UK High Commission, with the UNISA School of Computing, and the Cybersecurity Hub, and also Department of Educa Basic Education, which joined us towards the end of the project. So the toolkit is, is for parents, it's for caregivers, it's for teachers, and it's for students. So one of the things that we, we deal with at the Hub is receive the cybersecurity incidents that are happening in South Africa on a daily basis. So one of the reasons that the, the kit was developed was to deal with the issue of the kids who are actually using 90% of the cyberspace. Parents are hardly there, as you've just said. We've heard on the clip here, they, 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 they know how to be on social media, but there's no one who is telling them, and there's no education on how to behave on the social media. So I call this, sorry. 
my alarm, ladies and gentlemen, sorry. Uh, I call this um, toolkit a driver's license to cyberspace. You don't give your child a car without taking them to a, to a driving school. So when you give them the smartphone, what education are you giving them? So we have lots of artifacts on the toolkit, your videos, your cartoons, your, your word searches, uh, games that are actually teaching them knowledge on the cybersecurity space. And the second one, we have cybersecurity awareness programs that we are doing with in partnership with Department of Basic Education. So what we do is we focus on cyberbullying because that is what is happening in schools. One of the things I always tell the kids is think, take the word think before you, you, you post anything on social media. Is it true? Is it honest? Is it inspiring? Is it kind? Is it even uh, necessary for you to post that? Then once you have that in mind, you will know if you still go on or not. And you don't owe anyone honesty on social media, so you can just lie. So we do have initiatives that we are doing, and we hope to do more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sipokazi. Like they say, all good things must come to an end. So we don't have much time, but really uh, appreciating your thoughts after watching that uh, episode and really excited that these engagements should continue even after other episodes are aired, especially looking at how do we work together as parents, as educators, and as young people to make the digital space very safe and secure and to provide the right information that can enable young people to make informed and healthy decisions and choices. Thank you, over to you, Danelle. Thank you very much, Dr. Remy. I think that discussion also has just reminded me, and I'm sure many of us in the room, quietly at the back of our minds, we still have a long way to go to be great parents where the social media is concerned. Actually, coming to think of it, I think of my own posts, and I think, how many times have I been a little bit of a Kim Kardashian on Instagram? I hang my head in shame. <laughs> Thank you so much for that amazing conversation. I'd like to call up a very phenomenal youngster on stage right now. Uh, this person that is going to join us next really does not need an introduction, but I'll go ahead. Uh, he doesn't need an introduction in the high school space. He's by far the most unpopular, popular high school speaker who speaks on highly controversial issues, having won his first gold at Eisteddfod at the age of nine. Right? That's how I felt when I read up on him. His love for public speaking has grown, making him better and better at the sport. He's known for his quiet glares when analyzing a space and analyzing reading a room as well. He's an inspirational, motivational, topical, and extemporaneous speaker, having glazed or placed at gold rather and platinum levels in all those categories. His keynotes include Thinking and living like a tree, the wisdom is deep, profound. We should all think, and I quote him, we should all think like Mandela. And I quote him again, lessons my mother continues to teach me. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me welcome Arabile Mupiri. Can someone lower the mic? Program director, what a time to be alive. What a time to witness the social drivers, curriculum leaders and presidents of our country tackling the one issue that is common to all learners, from Cape to Musin. Never did I think I'd witness the various stakeholders discussing the necessity of a comprehensive curriculum that touches each of us in one way or another. What a day to witness the first step of what is to become honest,
conversations. Minister of Basic Education, Mrs. Angie Mutsecha, I greet you virtually. Deputy Minister of Basic Education, Dr. Regina Mhaule. Ministers and Deputy Ministers present, MECs, Directors General and their deputies present today. CEO of the South African Broadcasting Corporation, HODs, partners, stakeholders, panelists, and my fellow learners. All protocol observed. <laughs> In September of this year, the Speaker of the City of Johannesburg invited me to keynote at an event of hers, the Young Men's Conference. At this conference, I urged government to have shows that tackle uncomfortable issues surrounding comprehensive sexuality education. Dr. Deputy Minister, what impresses me is not so much the fact that the program is taking off, but it's more on the urgent turnaround time that this plea received. We are a nation in need of this, more so in this time than any other. Minister Mutsekha, your department continues to make strides, ma'am, and maybe sometimes unpopular. But if there's one thing that our overall integrated curriculum needs, it is an abrupt, comprehensive sexuality education. <laughs> Especially in this dangerous digital age. So allow me to say, as all learners across South Africa, from state and independent schools, we welcome this. Kina ko. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to state that this silence we talk of today was broken a long time ago. It was. But you see, the problem is that the cries have often fallen on deaf ears. But the time is never late. After all, a stitch in time saves nine. So there is still time. And there is still hope. Not all is lost. For too long, have my age mates been crying for a non-filter, comprehensive sexuality education? For too long, have my age mates been yearning for a relative life orientation curriculum on understanding our bodies and our coming of age? For too long, have my age mates been begging for equality and transformation the intersectionalities in this topic, Dr. Mhaule, far outreach even the most complicated spider web to exist. It is important that we discuss this, among many others, during the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, as this is also a component of comprehensive sexuality education. Let us also remember that cyber sharing can be very dangerous and may lead to bullying, inadvertent or otherwise. I pause for a moment for my colleagues, Ulufuno Mabunga and Latita Naku. Bullying itself is intertwined. Sometimes it's through hard remarks that boys say to girls about their bodies. Sometimes it's what those that girls say to other girls about their bodies. And the inverse of that is also often toxic. 
So it continues on to sexual orientation. Orientation within those orientations. And then there's gender nonconformity and gender non-binaries. And, and, and. But then again, we would need to address our curriculum's engagement with too much heteronormative literature. From the poetry we read to the pieces of comprehension texts that are prescribed to us. Again, another intersectional component. And for the parents who will be challenged, Mr. Mshanga, ask them to go on YouTube or Netflix to watch a show called Sex Education. England is further than us. Take it from me, as a 15-year-old heterosexual boy, overall, sexuality education can never be a taboo because it is an imperative for our overall development in the schooling system. Guys, we have been gifted with a wonderful learning area called life orientation. In it, we learn about constitutionality. Then through that, we learn about certain rights. Then consent. Then what sexual consent means, and the age of consent, and so on. But then, some of my age mates are faced with early unintended pregnancies. And it's the girls that are blamed for it, shamed for it, simply because boys cannot show signs of impregnation. And so the intersection continues. Then you start experimenting with drugs, then the alcohol. And then some of our learners drop out in great numbers. Some become frustrated and depressed. And that spills over to mental health overload. Yes. <sighs> I can go on forever. The reason it is comprehensive is that it is never ending. And you can never definitely pin it down. I mean, no country has its right. And in South Africa, all we can do is try. But this program, it gives me hope, Austin Hope that honest conversations will be had with all learners in Mzansi. There is hope. Before I take leave, Dr. Watson, <laughs> a little buddy told me that the DBE has prepared really detailed and helpful, comprehensive sexuality education lesson plans for our LO educators. We thank the department for that. I think these will really be helpful. But I'm also very honored to have been invited yesterday to the Sojiesk Sensitization Workshop held in Cliptown and was hosted by Mr. Liko Bottoman. In this workshop, I experienced socialization, which is another aspect of comprehensive sexuality education. I am hopeful of the generation that you are trying to shape out of us. We will be that generation that will see the end of gender-based violence. We will be that generation.
that will see true transformation in sexuality, in schools. We will be that generation that will understand the true essence of comprehensive sexuality education. We will be that generation. Yeah. <laughs> Deputy Minister Mhawle, accept my humble gratitude on behalf of all South African learners, as I say, well done to you. Well done to the team at ACBC Education for putting this together. And well done to all the other stakeholders present here today. It is never too late. As much as a journey of a thousand miles begin with a single step let this journey of a thousand conversations begin with a single word. <laughs> the time is now. <laughs> Tick tock. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're so incredible. Thanks. Yes, well done. Well done. And you're 15? Yeah, 15. Insane. It's insane, your wisdom at the age of 15. And I said at the beginning, I don't think we give our youth enough credit. They really are smarter and way ahead than we expect. You're doing very well. May Thank I shake your hand? Sure. Aww. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I'm proud of you. I'm blown away. I'm not too sure about you, but I think I need to go back to my education and pick a course that can me measure me up to him. Well done. And I really hope we have all heard what he said about life orientation. I think in most of my conversations with um, Liko or Tatu Potoman, I've said nonstop that greatest gift we have in all education is life orientation. It is, you can design the most complicated vehicles under the sun, but if you are unable to uncomplicate to the youth, the human anatomy and its functionality, we have failed. So life orientation needs to be taken very seriously. And thank you for that, young man. Thank you so much. Ao, Tlebat Pamudimu, o Arabil, eh? Ntate Mupiri, Agir, Raleovoch, Tobel. Now, a teacher by profession who has been an MEC of education in Mpumalanga for many years before joining the Department of Basic Education as the Deputy Minister. Among many other roles she has in her portfolio as Deputy Minister, she champions the care and support interventions of the DBE and serves on the South African National AIDS Council Interministerial Committee. To present the, base, the basic education sector, it gives me immense pleasure, great pleasure, to ask our Deputy Minister of Basic Education, Dr. Regina Mhaule, to give us our keynote address. Thank you. We're used to speaking with our masks on. Yes. I want to promise you that these educated men and women will never let you and your colleagues down. Yes. And your lives with all of your crew will never be the same. And especially your children will never experience what your brothers and sisters have experienced. Yeah. 
Let me greet you, Program Director. I failed. <laughs> Dineo, thank you very much for this opportunity. And let me start by greeting the servant of God, Reverend Moyan, in our midst. When we are here, we feel the presence. Thank you. <laughs> Greetings to the head of Department of Education in Pumalanga. You are the most senior official of the department when we are here. <laughs> so all of them, they come after you. <laughs> so I want to greet my minister, Umam Enji Mutsekha. Yes, she says, please. I can't say what she said when she said, I'm not coming. She says, please, from today, you can ask whatever. <laughs> I said, minister, are you sure? <laughs> But uh, I know she would have loved to be here, but an unforeseen circumstance just erupted. That's why she is not here. But her whole heart is here. So I'm representing her. And as I speak, you must know that Minister Mutsaka is speaking in me <laughs> and through me. So I want to greet, whether in absentia or is here, the chairperson of the SAPC board, Bab Bongmusa. Makatini, uh, and want to thank him for his contribution that this day became a success. UNICEF country representative, Christine Mohigana, UNESCO regional advisor, Dr. Patricia Machawira. Sanek CEO, she might not be here, but I know also her heart is here with Dr. Tembikulu. We were together in Deben yesterday. She was working very hard the whole of last week. Senior government officials, representative of civil society, stakeholders and partners, teachers and learners in our platforms, various platforms that are open for them, parents. I think parents are also watching because they cannot leave this to teachers alone. Ladies and gentlemen, you are all very important, distinguished guests, Sanbonan. Let me take this opportunity Dineo, to welcome you all. You, I know we have been welcomed. You welcomed us warmly, and we felt at home, and Elijah stamped it. But uh, I also welcome all our guests and sponsors to the launch of this groundbreaking initiative breaking the silence television series. I think, you know, as I've seen you, and I know you are the most happiest person, even more than the Department of Basic Education, <laughs> that your dream has come to fruition. So this television series is developed with Red Pepper Studios and Ketim Pilo through the Global Fund Program on Adolescent Girls and Young Women. This groundbreaking television project is a 13-episode production. It would be broadcast on public pro broadcaster, the SABC. Some pay-per-view television channels have come forward to confirm that they would later broadcast with series at no cost to the government as their contribution to their cause. I think they need a very big round of applause for that. The production departs on SABC One from the 3rd of January. Is it the 3rd, no? 3rd of January, 2022. And Fundis will all be alive. Yes. <laughs> Every Monday. <laughs> yeah, we'll witness that day. Every Monday at 4.30, which is 16.30. Every uh, Monday. This is the government's coordinated response to the scourge of HIV, while also promoting sexuality education through the most loved medium, television, uh, and targeting school-going youth, especially adolescent girls. The main aim of this series is to influence behavioral changes in young people regarding HIV and AIDS, promote sexual and reproductive health, and promote combination uh, of prevention of HIV 
STIs and teenage pregnancy. Evidently, preaching to young people about the dangers of early sexual debate, unplanned pregnancies, HIV and AIDS, and condom use hasn't yielded the desired results. New research demonstrates that the promotion of abstinence messaging alone has not impacted a behavior and reduced the incidences of early and unplanned learner pregnancies and HIV infection among our youth. Thus, the Global Community Network on HIV and AIDS has resolved that a combination prevention strategy is required to turn the situation around. They recommended a singular focus on HIV prevention, condom usage, and promotion of contraception among adolescent girls. The Global HIV and AIDS Network believes these measures are adequate to change the situation of unplanned learner pregnancies and the rising of HIV infection among school going youth. Furthermore, research suggests that condom use among South African youth has dropped significantly in recent years despite the comprehensive sexuality education and the HIV and AIDS life skills education program offered in schools. It is a no-brainer that we are resorting to the time a honored tactic to engage young people through entertainment while teaching them life-changing skills. Hence, the Breaking the Silence television series uses a document, a document a format that captures the intergenerational dialogue between teachers and learners using the reality TV style. The television series is influenced by empirical evidence that one of the best education modalities to drive comprehensive sexuality education effectively is through a continuous safe and protected teacher-learner dialogue. I want to thank you, uh, Dineo, that you started this dialogue ahead of us. The series is designed to promote structured opportunities for young people to honestly explore their own attitudes and values in the arena of sexual and reproductive health. It further offers them opportunities to practice the skills they acquire through dialogues, thus helping them to make informed decisions about their health and well-being. The series considers that our education centers deliver school-based sexual and reproductive health services by design within the operational framework of care and support for teaching and learning. See STL programs delivered to most schools. With this public launch, we end an exciting CSTL week that started on the 22nd of November 2021 with a colloquium of CSE, Comprehensive Sexuality Education, and the Key to Gender Responsive and Social Inclusive Education, a collaboration with the University of Johannesburg uh, later, an invigorating second national CSTL conference was held virtually from the 24th until the 26th of November 2021, a collaboration with the National Education Collaboration Trust, uh, Meet Africa, and UNICEF. Yesterday, a community outreach uh, program was hosted in collaboration with Access Chapter 2 at Cliptown Youth uh, Center to workshop teachers and tutors on working with gender and sexuality diverse children. And so tonight, we end the week by unveiling our television series, Breaking the Silence. <laughs> the flagship care and support initiative known as the Integrated School Health Program implemented with the Department of Health and the Department of Social Development allows us an opportunity with our social partners to use schools as vehicles for promoting access to a range of public services in areas such as health, poverty alleviation, psychosocial support, sports, and culture. The health program contributes to learners' health and well-being by screening them for health barriers, uh, 
to learning and linking them to services to address the identified barriers. The program offers a comprehensive and integrated package of services, including sexual and reproductive health services for older learners. The health services package includes a significant health education component, such as a leading a healthy lifestyle and drug and substance abuse awareness. Breaking the Silence television series is a brainchild of our department and a digital addition to this package of care and support. As a teacher myself, I know the value of basic education. It is the only discipline that offers long-lasting behavioral change to young people. As the government, we have pinned our hopes on basic education reforms as a ladder out of poverty, boosting economic growth and achieving prosperity. Through quality education, we believe we will win our new struggle against the triple burden of diseases, that is COVID-19, rising HIV infection amongst adolescent girls, and the scourge of TB. In, recent, in a recent interministerial committee of the South African National AIDS Council, the Deputy President, Honorable uh, Didi Mabuza, called for an integrated response to HIV and AIDS, TB and COVID-19. Breaking the silence is one part of a long term to influence society and curb this burden of triple diseases. As we know, the poor and vulnerable tend to be susceptible to diseases such as HIV and AIDS uh, and TB. Our target response to this triple disease burden must alter the disease progression amongst vulnerable adults, young girls, and people living with comorbidities. As the government, we are fully aware that the economic reconstruction and recovery plan depends on a healthy adult population, flourishing learners in proper schools, and the vulnerable being cushioned from the ravages of poverty and neglect. The National Strategic Plan on HIV, TB, and STIs, which ends in March 2023, focuses on young people, especially adolescent girls and young women between the ages of 15 and 24. Uh, Prime Director, another silence we need to break concerns the menace of gender-based violence that disproportionately affects women and girl children. Despite the concerted effort in addressing gender-based violence in the country, the illness continues unabated. There are ongoing instances of femicide with some deaths committed in the most heinous manner imaginable. We have to break the spell of this tragedy. Surely someone knows something. The public launch happens against the backdrop of the 16 days of activism for no violence against women and children, which calls for societies to end violence against women now. Now, I am happy to report that it is now a criminal offense to remain silent if one witnesses or knows of the incidences of gender-based violence and femicide. It is a moral imperative to report, campaign for the end of gender-based violence and raise awareness in every corner of society. The slogan, if you see something, say something is now embedded in our legislative framework. As a society, <laughs> as a society to end gender-based violence, we must move away from toxic masculinities towards transformative masculinities. We must reach a point where perpetrators, primarily men, must take responsibility for their actions and stop dehumanizing women and girls. We must do more every day, not just on the commemoration of the 16 days of activism for no violence against women and children. It must be an everyday responsibility for each South African. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2021 theme is the year of Charlotte Manya Makeke, 16 days of activism, moving from awareness to accountability. 
The theme is timely, and it is about time we accelerate the arrest and uh, prosecution of gender-based violence offenders. Ultimately, our job must be to move society towards a gender-just and violence-free society. Thus, we move beyond the rhetoric and exchange from awareness raising to accountability from civil society formation and the government. Equally, we must reject toxic feminism fueled by the hashtag men are trash brigade and the government's weariness in arresting and prosecuting perpetrators of gender-based violence. It is not about men being trash, but the proliferation of broken men produced by a long line of broken families. Mm, my God. Mm. It is commonly known in our country that most boy children are raised in women-headed households. The absence of a father figure in a South African home is in itself an endemic in our society, and we need We need to ask uncomfortable questions about it. Clearly, this absence of male figures amongst the growing boy ch children contributes to the male monsters lurking in the homes, streets, shadows, and public toilets. Clearly, there is a role for public schooling to plug the gaps left by absent fathers through teaching the values of positive masculinity. As a society, we must deal head on with the perversive nature of patriarchy and toxic masculinities. We must rebuild the broken social fabric of our communities. It starts at a family level and it begins with me. We call upon all sectors of society to produce a new man who takes responsibility for one's action and speaks out to break the silence. We need men who place a premium on, a power, on the power of speaking out as the first step towards healing without expecting wine and roses. Our women and children can only begin a healing journey if the generational curse of pervasive violence no longer permeates their spaces. We call upon men and boy children to begin their own healing journeys by first owning up to one's past, showing remorse and seeking professional help to live a new life. The task of every, every former or rehabilitated ab abuser is to seek to banish the shame of one's childhood or adulthood of violence of any nature through putting himself through public humiliation. The idea is to break, thank you. The idea is to break the family curse and start a new chapter that places the woman's bodily integrity and sanctity of women's lives on top of the agenda. Program director, if we are to end the pervasive rape culture and gender-based violence in general, impunity must come to an end, and accountability must be the order of the day. The Breaking the Silence television series brings to the surface the essence of these hard topics that are ironically considered as soft issues. There is a lot that we may have left out in deciding what goes into the final product of each episode. I hope that we have done justice to the voices and contributions that were made by the educators, learners, and resident experts who participated in the production shoot. SABC One has assisted in placing breaking the silence in its broadcasting schedule. May the production reach every household and give families conversation status to improve the well-being of our children. I thank you all. Honorable Deputy Minister Dr. Regina 
you spoke with conviction, Mem Haul. I stand here today and I commit myself to your department on the matters of gender-based violence, on any other matter that builds and empowers this society, use my agency as and when. All you need to do is call my name. Three o'clock in the morning, I will wake up. I will rise and do the work that needs to be done for a better society. Thank you very much for that. We are nearly at the end of this very, I think it's like a family sort of vibe, right? It's nice, it's cozy. We're nearly at the end of this family meeting of ours and this mighty, memorable occasion. Please help me welcome Dr. Andile Dube for our vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, what a way to close this week. Wow. Um, uh, I am so sure that the colleagues are ready to take leave for the whole evening <laughs> and wake up tomorrow bright and early for their eight o'clocks. <laughs> um, I'd like to write on Arabile's uh, uh, protocols because I feel like all of you guys didn't do justice, so all protocols observed. Um, I think I'm just so overwhelmed with joy that the sector is where we are today. Um, it's been um, one of the greatest weeks in, in South Africa in the education system um, for comprehensive sexuality education and the whole uh, framework and framing of um, CSTL in the country. Um, I really, really would like to congratulate the colleagues from the department and all partners who have participated in this or have made it happen um, and have contributed whether through research um, where we're generating evidence or any programming. Um, thank you guys. It's just been overwhelming this week. Um, when the, con the colloquium which took place on Monday and Tuesday um, was closing, Prof said, that's Prof Brown, he said, hopefully in the sector we will stop um, this thing of lip service and talking and talking and talking and not doing anything. Um, and I really am very confident in that um, all the work that we've been doing, uh, all the work that the department has been doing, it's showing very tangible outputs, uh, whether it's from the lesson plans, whether it's from the life skills book that have been developed, whether it's from the revision of the CAN support for teaching and learning framework, uh, whether it's all the mobilization around mental health and psychosocial support, and just new evidence around the whole um, body of knowledge around sex and sexuality and what we have not known as a sector, but that is coming from evidence. So I think all of you guys, whether you are joining online through all social media platforms or who are, you are in the room, you are really contributing towards breaking the silence. You are contributing to what Arabile is saying, that you are making the world a better place. I've got children, I've got an 11-year-old son, and I keep him here on this planet in South Africa, and what you are doing is making his future be better and all other colleagues. So thank you, everyone. So I think you, you really deserve the round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, um, I mean, when you when when Daniel was 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 asking about parents and what we talk about, whether we talk about the sex and sexuality to our children, I raised my hand. But when I thought about what you are saying about think, I realized that I actually possibly have to have a conversation on a continuous basis. Um, when I'm hearing conversation around negotiating and respecting his privacy, <laughs> I realize that I actually need to be part of some lesson because where as a parent my negotiation fails, I began to con control and end up saying because I'm your mother. And he always now reminds me at 11, when I ask you something, please don't say because I said so. 
Um, and so I'm going to learn more to negotiate and try more to use all the evidence that we are gathering in the sector to, to, to support our children. So thank you. Um, my job actually was about just thanking everyone, which will take another 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Christine, I am going to be on leave as from January every half past four because I need to watch Breaking the Silence. So no meetings, please, everyone. Every Monday at half past four, I'll be on leave. Please do direct. Oh, you don't do direct things. But. <laughs> so I would like to thank the following people. Um, Elijah, I wanted to go through each and every one in this room, but time is not allowing. And I was going to show you that, as you said, it must be in the vote of things. I would have done that. But maybe we respect other people's time and make sure that they get to cocktails and get home before 8 o'clock so that you are nicely seated on your couches at 8, 8 o'clock for very important conversations. To the Minister of Basic Education and Absentia, thank you, um, Honorable um, Angie. Uh, you always uh, give matching orders. You're always uh, leading from the front and always making sure that um, you support all the um, in interventions in, in, in the country and the, the system, particularly driving everything that has to put the child at the core of everything that we do on a daily basis. Uh, DM, uh, thank you very much. I feel like in the past uh, Six months, you've just been on the road, and hopefully you will take a little bit of leave tonight as well, um, and wake up bright and early to renegotiate. But thank you for um, your championing issues of care and support for teaching and learning, because as we know, no curriculum intervention will go well. No child will learn if the environment is not conducive for teaching and learning. And so can support for teaching and learning is one of the most critical foundation for any education and performance and quality improvement and attainment and all the things that encourage school to work transition for the children. So thank you. Thank you, Matt DM. UNESCO for your technical guidance and all the support in the sector, in CSE, and all financial investment in putting together this event. Um, the sector remain uh, very thankful, and we are hoping that each time um, the department and all partners are calling on you, you never get tired, you keep those pockets open. The same to the Global Fund for believing in the vision and supporting us both financially and also technically. We, we're very, we're very, very uh, grateful. We also would like to thank Katie Bilo for the advocacy because no matter how great the series is or the interventions are without advocacy, they'll not reach the ears that it needs to reach and behavioral change will not happen in, in the areas that we, um, we, we, um, we need. SAPC, not only did they support so much of uh, learning, uh, continuation of learning during COVID-19, but they continue to really create spaces, yes, even on SAPC one, but they create a, a spaces for accessibility of all material, but for the conversations to happen. So we are thankful, SAPC. Guys, please do pay your licenses, okay. <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, Red Pepper for a job well done uh, in this production. Um, I mean, Liko and uh, colleagues four years down the line would have come up with the best of, in, uh, of content, but without the uh, technical and the uh, rich um, artistic and innovations that you put in, this would have not happened. Thank you, Red Pepper. Um, thanks, <laughs> Miss Pinky Ha. <Her. laughs> Yeah, now I'm gonna dye my hair to just to fit because I hear what you're saying. But for using your identity and your brand to align with all that is positive and all that uh, makes life better for the children of South Africa. Um, and if your involvement in those changes just the life of, I don't know, 1,000 children um, and multiply it to the power of 77, then you're doing a great job, thank you. I would like to also thank UNICEF um, uh, for always uh, putting children first. It feels like I'm thanking myself as well, but I was talking about UNICEF as a whole. <laughs> so thank you, UNICEF. Um, without the interventions, um, without um, putting children at the core, 
we don't have any children to raise and we don't have any social, um, um, social assets that are needed for a better country. Lastly, Department of Basic Education. I started with ministry, but I wanted to just check uh, the team. Please just raise your hands. DPE team. Liko, you can raise your hand as well. You guys are the bomb. If I had to choose another team to be part of the Department of Basic Education and to take care of the policy, the system, the structures, the evidence, and, and, and I will still choose you for many other reasons. Thank you. And lastly, and lastly, I would like to thank everyone who's joining us from home and everyone who's going to make sure that this is um, uh, watched and who will share the messaging, the community structures that will encourage their children to watch, um, the schools that will possibly even find champions to champion the, the series. As you heard, I'll be watching. I am sure that the minister, the DM, will be watching. I am sure that the principals will be watching and everyone will be watching. And let's get the messaging going. Let's get this on social media. And I would like to thank you guys for making sure that my pastor knows exactly where I am today. This music is one thing that go, I'm going to tweet about because I couldn't go to church, but you have revitalized me. So thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Merry Christmas. It was an absolutely amazing evening. Thank you very much, Doc. We appreciate it. That is Dr. Andy Ledube. My work here is done. It was an honor to serve you as program director. It's an honor to serve at the SABC. It's an even greater honor to serve within the Department of Education. As best I can, I will forever use my, ag my agency. So thank you for thanking me for shining a light on anything that is positive in society. Dineo Wanakaranaka Oaganu Vukuza Ukokusoma Asha signing out. Thank you so much. It's been pleasant. It really has been pleasant. Before you leave, before you leave, may I please request that our Deputy Minister leaves first. We observe that protocol and give that respect. And then the rest of us can go for cocktails outside. Please do keep safe, sanitize, keep those masks on. Let's keep on observing protocol. Well, the Ui protocol. Hey, protocol here, protocol there. We're even giving protocol to COVID-19. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, do enjoy the rest of your evening. Don't you forget, January the 3rd in 2022, half past four, we are on air on SABC, breaking the silence. Good night.